Hi, God TV family. We are excited to have you join us for this exclusive series of conference sessions brought to you by Chosen People Ministries. Recorded earlier last year, this conference titled Finding Shalom in a Troubled World couldn't be more timely in what we see today around the world, particularly in Israel. In this program, we are joining our special guest speakers in a Q&A session. So grab your Bibles and prepare your heart to receive what God has for you today. All right, so the thing about a conference is everybody has their specialism, the things that they want to say, and they're looking at it from different angles. And there has to be a time when we bring it all together, so we've got something to take away. We call that synthesizing, and uh, that's what we're going to do. Um, lots of things that have been said, and what I've done is I've drafted two questions, uh, and I'm just going to then pass the mics over and let them fight over it. I don't think they will fight over it. I think they, they will have a lot to say, though. Uh, and out of today, this is what I want to know. So Daryl says, lose well. And I like that, uh, especially when he used Jesus as the example, because he says, think long term, and we have the ultimate vindication at the end of the age. I haven't misrepresented you there. No. Okay. Um, but also in the Bible, the prophets are confrontational. They speak out. We're told not to hide our light, not be fearful of speaking the truth. Paul was very confrontational when he needed to be. Now, I know there's nuance needed here. There's different audiences and situations. But, you know, my purpose is to get people riled and just ask the question and then let them deal with those issues. So my question is the first one, how do we reconcile that tension as Christians? On the one hand, being loving and gracious and not getting involved in politics, but also standing up for truth. We need some practical help on that. As people who face it daily, we face it in work, we face it with what our kids are being taught in school, things that we reject as believers, and we're expected not just to accept the ways of the world, but increasingly to celebrate it. So that's the first question. Give us some practical advice on how we navigate these waters that we've been talking about. The second question, uh, Mitch earlier and I were talking, and uh, he made the very good point that the Jewish people have historically been marginalised in the societies they lived in. And the problem is, here in the West, the church has a history of triumphalism and being at the centre of society. Even 30 years ago, when nobody believed it, or 50 years ago, the church still had a place in society. And it's new for us to become marginalised. And my question is, as we have a largely Jewish audience, two-thirds, so the first wave were the... Americans, then we had the Brits, and now we've got a predominantly Jewish um, panel here. What can the 2,000-year Jewish experience teach us and help us on how we can survive as Christians now increasingly becoming marginalised? We're moving from the centre of society to the margins. It's all happened very quick. We haven't gone through anything like the Jewish people have gone through historically. But they have 2,000 years of history to teach us how they retain their Jewishness. How can we retain our Christian faith as we move to the margins? Those are the two questions. How do we reconcile the tension between uh, the one side and not being confrontational on the other? And what can the Jewish experience teach us about how we navigate these waters. That's it. So if you could, uh, have we, has everybody got a microphone? I've got one that some of us are lapeled and some of us have a hold mic. Okay. Oh, okay. Brilliant. Yeah. So uh, seeing as the first question relates to the one Daryl brought up, we'll let him answer first. Okay. And then I know we, well, I hope we'll get a, a different answer from Michael. So we'll <laughs> kick off with that. <laughs> And then we'll do, take it. Do you want us to disagree, Car uh, Calvin? Or? We can disagree visibly. <laughs> because just tell us what you, I mean, it's been a very agreeable conference. I don't want, 
I don't want enmity for the sake of it. And I, I don't mind how you work it out, but ultimately I want us to have some practical guidance on how we living in 21st century Western society navigate these waters with our families and friends. Ultimately, I think that's what the conference is very much about. Okay, well, let me open since um, I'm the one who created your first question, <clears throat> for which I don't apologize. Um, let me first make this observation, that Jesus was harshest in his ministry with those who should have known better. We tend to be harshest with those outside the church. Um, so that's the starting point. Second point I'd make is, is if you look at the passages on cultural engagement where the assumption is you're engaging with outsiders, it is consistently said that we are to engage with gentleness and respect. It's in the First Peter 3 passage, set Christ apart as Lord, be prepared to give a defense for the hope that is in you, but do so with gentleness and respect. In Colossians 4, uh, verses 4 through 6, you get, as you, make a, uh, as you have opportunity to speak with outsiders, um, do so, uh, always let your speech be seasoned with salt. Key term there is always. In Galatians 6.10, you have do good to all people, especially those of the faith. So Colossians deals with your speech, and uh, Galatians deals with all your actions. Uh, that's an interesting text because sometimes we say we can treat believers one way and can treat people outside the church another way, and that passage takes that distinction away. We should treat everybody, uh, try and treat everybody the same. So what do we do with the challenge? I, I say that the gospel inherently has a um, tension in it. It is the tension between the challenge of saying you need to deal with your sin, which challenges anybody, Okay, But then the other half is the invitation that there's a way into a new life and a hope. In fact, when Peter has one word to summarize the faith with, he chooses the word hope to highlight it. And my point is, if you emphasize the challenge at the expense of the hope, you never get to the good news. So you want to be sure that however you do your, confront, your confronting in relationship to the offer of the gospel, that the gospel never gets lost in the offer. And unfortunately, I think I watch the tone of what goes on in much of what is shared in the way we engage with the world, world and I think we're challenge heavy. Because we want to be sure people get sin. Well, um, I actually do think people get sin. They don't, just don't want to cope with it. They don't want to do anything with it. So uh, they want to run away from sin. And you're not going to convince them by your words about that. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, and I, I, I really prefer to let him do his work and I do mine, which is to be as faithful as I can in representing the gospel and in what it represents, in describing what righteousness is in contrast to unrighteousness, those kinds of things. That's where the confrontation will occur. Uh, but to do so in a way that says then in the midst of this mess that I'm describing that we find ourselves in, there's also a very beautiful way out, and that's through the grace of God and through his kindness and through his offer on our behalf. So that's how I would try and put much of that together in, in terms of dealing with the tension. The place where I want to be the harshest in some ways, if I have Jesus as the model, is to be sure that we aren't misrepresenting God in the way we're presenting him to the world. Uh, Michael, um, Daryl's is, I know you're both academic, but you're very much more at a popular level in terms of your ministry. So, I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to cause a, a disagreement here, but is there a sense in which in an academic setting it's more, it's more easy to do that and in a, on a, in a social media setting yeah. it's much more difficult? I, I don't know. That's well, Daryl intersects with the, with the popular as well. I may have a certain reach by God's grace, which is very broad, um, but Daryl's writing constantly on, on the, the fleshing it out level as well. So I want to absolutely affirm that the spirit in which we do things is always critically important. But just as followers of Jesus is light in the darkness, we will be hated. It, it's a given. 
the more we're like him, the more we'll be hated. Right, John 15, if, if they hated me, they'll hate you also. Matthew 10, if, if they call the master of the house Beelzebub, what will they call you? The very Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. So as we live godly lives as disciples, trying to mind our own business on the one hand, we will come in conflict with the spirit of the age. Uh, in, in the Bible I have here, I, I carry a note that a father gave me with uh, tears and pain. He said, pray for my daughter. Here's her name, Beatrice. She's 23 now. She identifies as a man. She's having her breast removed. She won't talk to me anymore. We get the endless emails and calls from people experiencing all kinds of crisis in their home because of the fruit of of LGBTQ plus activism. In 2004, God began to burden me to push back against the activism in the society. And I thought, why me? I don't come out of homosexuality. I don't have a particular burden to reach this sector of the population. My, My doctorate's in a whole different field. I'm not a family counselor. You've got James Dobson, Focus on the Family. You've got all these different organizations, political. What do you need me for? What I realized then was no one gets to sit this out. That I saw in 2004 that this was the principal threat to freedom of religion, speech, and conscience already in America. 2004, that was clear. And a few months later, God laid something on my heart, and this is what we followed ever since. Reach out to the people with compassion. Resist the agenda with courage. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to give a presentation on why same-sex, quote, marriage is not really marriage in God's sight, if I'm going to give a presentation on, on myths and uh, about transgender things, etc., I'm going to do it in such a way that I'm thinking there's a 15-year-old kid on the front row, raised in church, thinks that God hates him because he's gay, he's suicidal, and he showed up that day wondering, is there any hope for him? So I, I want to have a heart of compassion, but with a backbone of steel, because we have to stand. If we don't stand, if look, it was William Wilberforce and the church that, that overthrew slavery. So, so we have roles to play, whether it's against racism, and segregation, whether it's against abortion, whether it's against gay activism. If we don't stand, if we don't speak, in a different context, Jesus says, if the light within you is darkness, how great is the darkness? So my issue is not so much the presence of darkness, it's the absence of light. So Daryl's absolutely right. We spend a lot of our time flailing against the darkness. What we have to do is live as children of light, but there will be conflict. Uh, I was, I think the last time here, I was in a vehicle with a nurse, a British nurse, and she said, I am required by the hospital when a man who identifies as a woman comes, I'm required to put down that he's female, but I know that will get him wrong health care. Because you know, like a stroke for a man can be different than a stroke for a woman or what you prescribe or how you treat things. I said, what do you do? She goes, I disobey the hospital and I write down the truthful information for the sake of the patient. Well, people do that and they lose their jobs. So we are in a situation where we have to stand. Our kids are being influenced. Our kids are being impacted. But we have to do it in a way that's reflective of Jesus. In, in America, we are so politicized in the church We have such a deep connection with our nation as, quote, a Christian nation and its origins that we really mingle politics and faith in a way that we become basically identified with a political party and candidate, and that turns the world away. So that's the the fine line to say, yes, we are involved politically, but our hope for transformation is the gospel. Yes, we do stand on social issues, but it is because of Jesus, not because we are right wing or left wing, etc., So if we keep the spirit right, hearts of compassion, backbones of courage, and expect we will be rejected, we will be hated, comes with the territory. But let it not be, 1 Peter 4, right? Let it not be because we're acting foolishly or we're mean-spirited. Let it be because of Jesus. Okay, thank you. So we have two different strands here. This conference is... uh, We've got apologists and we've got um, people involved in Jewish ministry. So... I want us to take a step back from that. And, and Mitch, I, I really think you can help us with this. As a, a person who's Jewish, who knows immensely about the Jewish history and experience over the years and as a, a scholar, uh, can you, moving aside from that question we've been looking at, which we'll probably return to, how can the, the, the Jewish experience help us as Christians 
prepare as we start to move to the margins? Uh, and how can we do it as, as good a job as you guys did when everybody has sought to exterminate Jewishness, but it's as strong as ever? So what can we learn from that in, in, in terms of navigating the choppy waters of, of culture wars and whatever? Well, first of all, I have a, a, a double problem. I'm on the margins as a Jew, and I'm on the margins as a Jewish believer, and I'm on the margins as a Christian. So I'm really, I'm like off the margin chart. <laughs> and so uh, it's a very comfortable place for me to be, you know? And uh, I think that Jewish people and some of us as Jewish believers, and I live in the Holy Land, uh, Brooklyn, New York, and I'm surrounded, and uh, Mike talked about uh, dancing with the Hasidim, and uh, I have that opportunity on a regular basis, if I choose, uh, to do that. And so I am uh, very aware of the fact that in New York City, I'm part of a majority, catch that, as a Jew, and part of a minority as a Jewish believer. <laughs> so it's... it's, it's I have identity issues, but you know, uh, but I, I know what my, my, my pronouns are. But so, so there are a lot of challenges here, but I can speak as to what I think are, are some issues that are, and might be helpful. One issue is this. I, when I listen to my Christian brothers and sisters talk about the Judeo-Christian heritage being washed down the toilet, and when I hear about uh, what I sometimes feel is anger uh, because their, our agendas are being suppressed and so on, I say to myself, at that point, well, you should be Jewish, you know? And what we've learned, number one, is that uh, we should expect to be marginalized. Now, that's not a, a particularly a negative thing, but... Jewish people never th sit around and think that they deserve to be the major part or determin determiners of culture, even in New York City. And so I think that part of the, one of the reasons the church is upset, both in Britain and the United States, and I just came from Australia, forget it, they're really upset. New Zealand, they're all, all the Christians are in rebellion. I mean, maybe rightfully so, because everything they stand for is, is suppressed and countered but governmentally. And so I think that an expectation of being marginalized and being part of a minority and working from that basis is really important. I think part of the problem is an expectation of privilege, if I can boil it down. And as believers in Yeshua, I think we need to get rid of that. And I see that all over the place. We deserve, just fill in the blanks, power, our point of view to be respected. We deserve our ethics to be considered. We deserve we deserve, we deserve. Brothers and sisters, we deserve hell. And we get the cross. And our privilege should be buried at Calvary. Yeah. If it were, then I think Christians would be set free to love instead of be angry. And I think that's an important lesson. The second lesson that I think I've, I've learned a little bit and that is the strength of community. Um, the other day I was at a church and I preached on Romans 11.5 about the remnant yesterday, today, and forever. <laughs> and as a Messianic Jew, I mean, the Bible flat out tells me that I'm in a minority movement. You can't understand the word remnant any other way, can you? I look forward to the great day. I hope I live to see it. I know I'll see it eventually, but 
I mean, the day when the whole nation turns, as Mike and Daryl were talking, everybody was talking about, you know, I'd love, oh boy, I, I'd love to be part of that movement, you know? And, uh, but right now I am part of a remnant. I'm part of a, a marginalized movement. And Jesus told me to expect that. And so I'm okay with it. And I think fighting from a point of weakness has its advantages. Mm -hmm. People underestimate you. Sometimes when your power is not taken seriously, that's an advantage in a fight. And we're in a fight, aren't we? I mean, if we're not fighting for over social, cultural issues, we're fighting over the gospel. I don't think I'm going to win the B'nai B'rith Prize for Man of the Year in Brooklyn next year. Uh, everybody has my address. If they want to shoot me, they're welcome. I mean, I'm, do I live under threat in, with my family under threat? Yeah, of course I do. I've been doing it for 35 years. Do I take it seriously? Not really. But I know that I am part of a remnant and more so, I'm part of a disliked remnant. And so I accept that posture because when I read the New Testament, it's all over the place. Maybe it's because of my experience that I read it that way. I think Christians need to recognize that they're part of a minority movement, that there is political and cultural and financial weakness, and that we are also disliked. Now, fortunately, I am surrounded by a not-yet-believing family that always reminds me that I'm part of a remnant and that I'm disliked. So I, I, have, so I, I do think there are advantages to it, but, but here's a quick story, and then I'll turn it over to my fellow minority movement people. Okay? <laughs> so, so, my, uh, so my cousin, uh, actually, the there are three daughters, each one of them is gay. And, uh, and so uh, the, the youngest one always loved me as an older cousin. The middle one always disliked me. And the older one, she never said. So the younger one got engaged as soon as, you know, the whole thing happened in New York about gay marriage. So she got engaged to another Jewish woman. My family's very Jewish. They only marry Jews, no matter if they're gay or not. <laughs> so, so she gets engaged, and at a conservative synagogue a couple of blocks from me, uh, they were having a, um, how do I say it? It's a, a kiddush, you know, at the end of a service, you know, of a Jewish service. So the kiddush, where you have refreshments, was in honor of their engagement. And so my young cousin invited me and my wife to come to their engagement at the conservative synagogue and to celebrate with them. Okay. You know, I had to think about that one, pray about it. And so I went. And uh, it was a gay rabbi, too. <laughs> and so, and so it was an interesting uh, evening. And I do love my little cousin. And uh, sorry that she's gone that route, but and so I'm standing around, you know, eating a little bit, and the middle cousin comes back to me and says, Cousin Mitchell, you know how much we appreciate you. We love you. We're so glad for you. Now, all three of these women work for the Jewish community. This one is a so MSW and a gerontologist. So she works with elderly Jewish people for the Jewish community. And she never said anything like that to me before. She said, I'm, we just, you know, we're so happy about where you are. And so on, I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> I said, you haven't talked to me in 15 years. You know, why, why would you be saying that now? She says, with a big smile, because if it wasn't for you, we'd be the black sheep of the family. <laughs> I said, well, thank you for the compliment. 
It's wonderful to be loved for any reason. So I was just marginalized by the most marginalized. And you come back and you say, Lord, I guess I'm, a, I'm marginalized. But you know, it's you and me. You were marginalized. You were rejected. You found power and weakness. You changed the world. And you know what? I'm going to just follow you. And I'm going to accept my fate. I'm not fatalistic. And I'm not the kind of person that accepts problems. If I see a problem, you know, I'm a mountain climber. I like climbing. I don't like climbing or going around it. Even if I could find a way around it, I'd much rather go through it, you know, and try and get it to move. But in general, I think the Jewish experience and the Messianic Jewish experience of accepting weakness as a pathway to strength is not something that is actually should be viewed as weakness within the body. I think it should be viewed as a good way to go. And so stop fighting the rest of the culture. Get people to believe in Jesus and then you won't be, then you'll be in the majority. Next. All right. Uh, the next one is for Fiona, because you just mentioned the issue of community. Uh, so can we just have a little bit more on how a Jewish historical approach to community within the family can assist us in imbuing our family with our values uh, in a way that perhaps we used to have a century or two ago where we would have meals together and, and we would, uh, you know, we would go to church together and, you know, that's kind of all gone now. We nurse our, our dinner on our lap and we don't get together. But what is it about the Jewish experience? I mean, Shabbat is an obvious example. I mean, just very quickly. I, Alan, I, I think you're doing well, but you're romanticizing it a little bit. <laughs> okay, you're painting a fiddler on the roof picture, which... I'm, I'm really trying hard to straddle know, this apologetic Jewish you're ministry. You're doing a great thing. job, brother. <laughs> uh, but uh, we eat together. We have the holidays together. We do different things together when you're kind of like quasi-secular religious uh, Jewish people. But mostly we sit around and talk about the Gentiles. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, but if we're, if we're talking about a religious Jewish community, it's insular. It's ingrown. It's not, and that's the difference. We're trying to reach out to the world and, and be an influence on the world, whereas the traditional Jewish community is insular. So don't bother us. Let us live our lives. And, as we, and then the Jewish mindset would be, as we live our lives as Jews, that's how we're alike to the world. Not by going out, by speaking, doing, but by living our lives as Jews and following the Torah and commandments, the traditional Jew would think, then the world sees us, and that's how they learn about the God of Israel. Yeah. But the degree of... The, the, the community, you know, we have to be radical in that respect. Uh, re, for example, just you can homeschool your kids, but if they have a cell phone with access to social media, yeah. they could get polluted with all kinds of things. You know, porn is ubiquitous. Yeah. So there is something to learn about, okay, we're in the world, we're not of it, right? To a traditional Jew, they're, they're not, again, seeking to shine the light out. But the radical choices of separation increasingly we have, to, we have to do those things. Obviously, train our kids to learn how to live in this world, but recognize the degree of pollution that's out there. And then in our own family, our own congregations, our small groups, those should be places of refuge yeah. where we come together, built up strength, and then from there, we go out into a hostile world and shine the light. I guess the reason I'm asking is because there is a, a view, it's called the Benedictine option. Have you come across this? Yeah, yeah, right Yeah, there. and the idea is very much now, uh, there's a swathe of Christianity that's saying, let's become totally insular. And, and I'm just trying to tease out how, we, how we get the balance there between... It's dead wrong. Yeah, okay, so okay. Daryl, go ahead and... Let me explain why. Tell them what the Benedict... Uh, the Benedictine idea is that we should become more insular. We've been, we, to some degree, we've been doing that and it hasn't done us any good at all. And the second reason is our calling and the Great Commission is not to go into the church and make disciples. It is to go into the world and make disciples. Mm -hmm. People who oppose what we think are not supposed to be seen as the enemy. Ephesians 6 says... Our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against cosmic forces. And people are not the enemy. They are actually the goal. 
And we've forgotten that. And because we've forgotten that, we have separated ourselves too much from the call to outreach, which is a very important part of what Jesus has asked us to be as the people of God. So we live out who we are as the people of God. We expect the pressure coming back. We understand that we will be pushed against. That comes with the territory. We accept that as going down the way of the Messiah. We don't do anything to provoke that. We don't try and provoke it. We just try and be who we're going to be. And the difference produces the reaction because when light shines in the midst of darkness and darkness doesn't want light, it will run to the darkness. And when you put that all together, what that means is we also have to have the community. This is important what Fiona raised. We have to have the community in order to support ourselves in the way that we can as we're reaching out. But if we're only being the community in a bubble, we are, we are um, stepping back from the most important thing. In fact, the last thing that Jesus told his disciples to be before he ascended into heaven. Okay, Brian, have you got anything to add? Just on this, super quick. Yeah. The other problem with the quote Benedictine option is it's, it's completely impossible. Mm-hmm. We, where do we all go? Tens of millions of us go in the hills somewhere? So it's, you're, it's Idaho. Going, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you have to just, you, we can't, you know, what, what does Jesus specifically pray in John 17, 15? I do not pray that you take them out of the world, mm-hmm. but that you keep them from the evil one. So, it, we build our communities. That, those are our liberated zones in the midst of the battle to be edified, encouraged, and then we go out. We, we meet together, we get strengthened, and then we go out and make the difference. And, you know, T.L. Osborne, famous evangelist, decades ago was talking about getting into Ukraine, and the Ukrainian officials were not happy with them and with some of the Christianity. He goes, the government should like us because you can't make a bad heart good, but the gospel can. <laughs> so the only hope of Britain, of America, is revival in the church that leads to mass evangelism, mass discipleship, and awakening, and, and hearts and lives being changed. That's, that's the only way we, we can move forward. Okay, Brian. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to speak to the, uh, what we can learn from, from the Jewish experience. Um, Daryl, your line was that we need to uh, lose well, correctly? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, to be able to lose well, you need to accept that you can lose. Mm-hmm. And many of us don't want to accept that we can lose. And I think we can learn a lot about that through the Jewish people because they accept and have accepted for centuries that they will lose in the short term while winning in the long term. Mm. And we need to recognize that that is actually a biblical understanding of the way that God oftentimes works. We are not assured victory in the short term, but we know where history is going. We know what God has prophesied. We know how it all ends. And so we can have hope in that while also accepting that we may not win in the short term. You know, I'll I'll never forget the first time that I visited uh, Istanbul, also previously known as Constantinople. And as I was walking the the streets there, I I knew some of the history. I knew that this was a place where uh, Christianity had triumphed for a a millennia, that they called it the, the, the second Jerusalem. They thought that Jesus was going to return to that city because that was the capital of worldwide Christendom. And uh, they built up their fortifications and they they would never, ever lose. And of course, we know in 1453 that the city was taken. And as I'm walking the streets there, they renamed the capital, uh, the the center of the capital over the conqueror who had uh, killed and enslaved uh, so so many Christians. And I'm walking around, and I'm an American. We've never been invaded. Uh, Britain hasn't been invaded for a thousand years, but the United States has never been invaded. I had never felt that, that feeling of being this small. And then thinking, well, what were those Christians thinking for all those years? That they were invincible. Mm. That no one could beat them. That Jesus was obviously going to save them from the armies that, was, that were coming against them. And yet that's not true. And I needed to accept that, well, maybe this victory that I just assumed that the church would always have, especially in the United States or in the West, maybe I'm not assured that. And maybe we could lose things like 
the East lost things. And so to get back to the Jewish people, the Jewish people have been in exile for millennia. Their liturgy, their, the way that they speak to each other, the way they think about the world, Jewish and Gentile relations, it's all on the basis of things are not the way that it's supposed to be. We are in exile. And yet, they've accepted that as reality. They've tried to make the best of it in the short term, but always keeping that next year in Jerusalem mindset that they know how, the, how it is all going to end. And so I think that we can learn a lot from that that we can allow ourselves to lose because we know that one, Yeshua has already accomplished the victory. That's what, why we celebrate on Sunday mornings. Um, but we also need to look at some of the Psalms where it's actually a lot of lamenting and a lot of crying out to God. We need to accept that maybe in the short term, we may lose some things, yet we know where all of this is going. Jesus is going to win, and we are going to be in that new Jerusalem. And so we can look forward with hope, even though we may lose in the short term. Thank you. So we're, we're in exile already, and we need to get used to it. And Hebrews 11 makes that clear. Uh, I'm not sure about America not being invaded, I recall. We burnt your capital in 1812. But anyway, that's a, that's a different issue. Um, there's a couple of people we haven't heard from. If we could hear from them and they now have the luxury of looking at any aspect of what we said and then we'll have just two or three more minutes if if any of the others just want to come back or if there's anything they want to say I just want to make sure we've really exploited these guys being here um and um and and then we'll wrap up Fiona I think you're going to say something. you asked the question about what we can learn from the Jewish community and how we take what we learn and use it in the life of the church or even the Messianic community. And I was thinking about this as we were sharing here. And yeah, we're right. We do sometimes over-romanticize the Jewish community. And the idea of community, even within the Jewish community, the Jewish world, is disintegrating also, as more and more of the Jewish community becomes secular and gatherings become about festivals, and it, it's not the everyday. There's also an issue that we don't like to talk about when we think about Jewish community, and that's the, the insular nature of some of the more um, ultra-conservative Judaism. And that's one of the dangers that you can have in the church, that we're insular that we're more interested in building up the church than reaching out to community. Mm -hmm. But one of the things we can learn from synagogue life is fellowship. We, you know, we, we were sharing with our congregation a few years ago and we were saying, listen, when we make kiddush and we share lunch together, which we do every week, it's you're saying that the time of fellowship is also holy. So you make the eating and the fellowshipping part of the active life of the congregation. It's a given that if you come to service in our congregation, you stay for lunch. And it's also become a given, which is wonderful, that if you stay for lunch, you will in some way serve, whether that's clearing, cooking, uh, putting food out, washing the loo, clean the loos before we leave, it's become a community activity. But I wonder how we will negotiate that if we grow. And whether we'll have cliques. Because the danger of community, you have insularity, where we no longer know how to or want to reach out and welcome others in. Within the community, you end up with little groups that are cliques, and you have a visitor come in, and they wonder how they can break in and be part of the group. I think we have to learn from the good and the bad. I think we shouldn't over-romanticize our, our Jewish community. 
I mean, I, I can remember a few, when I first came to London after it would be early 90s, and uh, my cousins discovered I was a nurse. So I get a phone call one evening. So what are you doing in London, Fiona? I hear you're nursing. And I thought, oh no, here it comes. Here comes the ask. You know, um, the older cousin, he's, he's bedridden. And we're looking to find a nurse to come and care for him. I thought, so you want me to be your servant? I don't think so. And I didn't know how to get out of it. So I played the Jesus card. I said, well, before you welcome me into your home, there's something you need to know about me. I've become a Christian and I believe in Jesus. End of conversation. <laughs> Literally. Well, that's very nice for you. We'll be in touch with you next week. Down went the phone. And I thought, hallelujah. <laughs> but the only problem with that is it shut the door to getting to know my London, a lot of my London relations. And I wish I hadn't done it. I wish I'd had the maturity and the wisdom to find another way out, like say, well, actually, I've got a permanent. Well, actually, I did say I've got a permanent job. And they say, yeah, but we could probably pay you more. And I'm thinking, to be your servant, I don't think so. There's good and there's bad in every community. So let's be honest, take what is good and leave what is not so healthy. But I do think that the church, if the church is going to grow with revival and then get passionate about mass evangelism, the church has to become a community. How many of us know our neighbors? How many of our neighbors have walked inside our, have knocked on our doors and actually come in and borrowed uh, a cup of milk or a bag of sugar? We don't do that anymore. And I think we need to. I think we need, if we are going to reach out with the gospel, we've actually got to build relationships. And ultimately that's what the synagogue life teaches you. Build relationships, build community. Get to know your neighbours. Thank you. Okay, that's great. So we've seen different perspectives and Fiona's very clearly an evangelist. Um, Tom, you have the luxury of saying whatever you want. I'll give you, a, I'll give you my final thought, last but not least. Well, let, let me just say what we're going to do. We'll hear your final thought and then we're just going to give one minute each to the two guys who are really involved, but it's got to be a minute just to wrap it up. And uh, so, Tom, you say this. We, we, I'll, I'll be quick. We, give them we've a got yeah. plenty of time, Mitch. We're doing great. Yeah. Carry on. Um, yeah, my thought really is just circling back to when you first asked the question, how should we respond to the attacks that we get or losing well or these sorts of things? And it reminded me of years ago when the new atheism rose to prominence. And someone asked Richard Dawkins that question in one of their atheist meetings. And he famously stood up and he said, you must mock them, belittle them, uh, make them feel so uncomfortable for holding their Christian beliefs that they're no longer uh, bold enough to speak them out. And that was his motivation there. And of course, looking back now, the new atheism is a failed cultural movement, I would say, in many, in many ways, although it still has a bit of influence. But that was his model. And he was a naturalist. He had no spiritual view. And I think a lot of debate is conducted like that, even within the church. It, it, it enforces the belief that there's an us and there's a them. It's very tribalistic. A lot of debate that's carried on on social media follows that pattern. People clinging so desperately for their, their, their team and their identity that if it was shattered beneath them, they'd have nothing to, to live for. And that's why it gets so heated so quickly. But we must remember we have a much more multidimensional worldview. We're not naturalists. We have a supernatural worldview. We know that although we're engaging with people, we, we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And yes, we're called to demolish arguments and strongholds raised up against the knowledge of God. So we, we can confront ideologies and ideas with truth and with clarity, but we must always remember, as I think Daryl was saying, that we are, or maybe Michael, we are speaking to people, people that Jesus loved, people that he died for, and ultimately, 
these ideologies behind them are ways that are trying to shield the light of the gospel. We, as ministers and ambassadors of the gospel, want to do away with that darkness by bringing the light and show the light of the gospel into all of these cultural battles. That's great. Okay, so one minute each, Daryl and Michael, and you can fight amongst yourselves who's going to have the last word. Let me, uh, let me just say it this way and why the relational part of this is so important and why getting to know and caring for people is so important. And that is because when you say God says to the average person who's a secularist, neither of those words means anything to that person. They don't believe in a God, which means they don't believe that God speaks. They think that when you cite the Bible, you are citing something that doesn't communicate or have anything to offer to them. So the only alternative you can offer to them is your lived out life. A lived out life that shows that you really do care for them, you are interested in them. That doesn't mean you're always affirming them, but it means that you're there for them. And in the midst of that, when you break the stereotype of what their impression of what a Christian is, and If a person isn't around the church, their impression of what a Christian is is going to come from one of two places, the Christians that they know or what the world says a Christian is. How many of you want that to be the definition of Christianity on your behalf? So it's very important to engage in such a way that you model what God did when he sent Jesus to the cross. And I like to shorten John 3.16 in this way. God so loved the world that he gave. And if we will do that in how we interact with people, we will open up the possibility for people asking, what makes you different? Yes, so I think, one, it's super important to have the final victory always in mind. So we are overcomers. I've worked with persecuted Christians and families of martyrs, and there's a tremendous note of victory because we know the final outcome. I do Jewish evangelism with tremendous confidence because even though I can't guarantee the salvation of a living Jew today, I know the final outcome. So we are overcomers. We, we always have that mentality. That's one. Two, we're called to be witnesses. We, we stand, we speak, we do what's right. The results are ultimately in God's hands. But if we've delivered our soul as witnesses, we've done what, what God wanted us to do. Number three, the key ultimately for the well-being of any nation where we are is the health and well-being of the church. If the church is healthy, then we will be a positive, life-giving uh, people in the midst of it. And then a healthy church is a church that's reaching out. The old Oswald Smith saying, <clears throat> the church that doesn't evangelize will fossilize. So out of a heart of love for God and people, we are reaching out, making disciples. And we do that until he comes. There's no magic moment that we did it, we got the quota. <laughs> God knows when that is. So there's always going to be conflict right until the end. But let's be a witness for our generation Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, the ultimate test of a moral society is the kind of world that it leads to its children. So that's in my mind. What kind of world are we living, leaving? What kind of example are we leaving? Let's live that out, and ultimately we'll see the triumph of God. Can I just say something to end? And it comes from a Scottish theologian from a bygone age. And he said something like this. The worth of a man's soul is determined by the object of his love and the manner in which he loves it. Mm. Okay, well, um, I'd like to thank our panel. We are very blessed and fortunate. And I'd especially like to thank CPM, who arranged everything. And uh, Mitch, you've got a fine group of people, and we're grateful to all the individual speakers who have given their time. I think I'm passing over to Mitch, but let's, let's show our appreciation to the panel as they take their seat. Well, God TV family, I do pray that you were blessed by today's session. And there are many more sessions as well from this conference that you can catch up on by going to god.tv forward slash B-O-D. Many programs there about Israel and about how you can be blessed through them and by them. Well, we do pray that you today feel God's shalom with you. And until next time, God bless.